So welcome uh, to this uh, last session we have of today, at least, um, where we are discussing the big topic of the future of Europe and the EU-UK relationship. So that's just a nice small topic to finish the day off with. Luckily, we have a drink after this at uh, 6.30. Well, no, it'll be different from water. It'll be, uh, <laughs> you know, the water will do for now, but at 6.30, hopefully we can have uh, something uh, a little bit more enjoyable uh, in that sense. No, but we're very pleased um, to be able to finish off today uh, with this session, as I said, on this uh, another big topic. And thank you very much for participating in the plenaries, and thank you to the co-chairs and, uh, sorry, the chairs and the speakers and so on of those uh, two particular sessions. We um, are going to discuss, as I said, this big topic of uh, where Europe is going and the future of EU-UK relations on a day where that latter question just feels that little bit more interesting. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled to have uh, Konrad Szymanski with us uh, here today, uh, the Minister for Europe, a position he's held, uh, both in the Council of Ministers and Cabinet since 2015. He'd served as a member of the European Parliament prior to that, 2002 to 2014, uh, where he'd been a member uh, of the, uh, uh, I think he'd worked on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I imagine, as well, yeah, and so on. The industry. And the Industry right, Committee yeah. as well. Well, that's useful to have both those. Yes, exactly. Industry Research and Energy, important extra word there as True. well, which I hopefully True. we'll get into in this topic uh, in the moment. And Olaf Hen Henriksen Bell. Olaf, thank you very much for joining us. Wonder how he's the director for um, EU, uh, the EU directorate at the Foreign Commonwealth and uh, uh, Development Office. Um, had positions in Paris as well, worked in the Treasury. Uh, so hopefully being able to bring, again, a, a rounded sense of the challenges that uh, Europe is facing and that the UK-EU relationship uh, will face as well going forward. Um, we're just going to have a bit of a conversation rather than speeches. We're going to talk a bit around uh, the big topics um, for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, then I want to bring you in because it's late in the day. And I saw from uh, what happened in Slavomir's first panel, he put like eight hands went up instantaneously. So I'm going to learn from that experience. Um, and uh, do feel free to get some ideas together that you want to bring in early. And the, the topic can go uh, very widely. But I thought we would start off just to get this out of the way a little bit where uh, one of the opening panels about Poland, the UK, and Ukraine uh, finished which is really to do about um, European unity. If we're going to talk about the future of Europe, I think we have to talk right now about how united Europe can be um, through this particular crisis and looking beyond it um, into the next year or two. Um, Ukraine, it is not just Ukraine. Europe was already facing some pretty severe challenges prior to it uh, in the post-COVID environment uh, with inflation uh, rising across the European Union, differential rates, but nonetheless, um, uh, energy prices are rising already again prior to the Ukraine uh, invasion. But a sense at that time that Europe was, was relatively united. It had its repower program. It had the big um, kind of rebuilding uh, 750 billion program for the post-COVID recovery. Uh, you know, there was a sort of logic to the coming together, some central funds that had been acquired uh, or at least allocated for one of the first times, almost a kind of euro bond, though we're not allowed to call it that, to, to, to help ensure that there was funding in place. Um, but Ukraine has added, it's turbocharged uh, the challenges. And I'm just wondering, starting with you, Conrad, if I can, how confident you are that as you look forward six months, uh, certainly through the rest of this year, maybe early into the new year, but with maybe a very difficult winter and autumn coming up, um, how united do you think European countries, not just the EU, but European countries can be in this next phase? Are you worried about a turning inwards, each country having to worry about its own electorate, its own challenges? And we'll talk about our own electorate over here in a minute. Um, uh, but, or do you think in a way Ukraine is actually acting as a glue? Is it forcing uh, European countries together to try and make sure that they don't split uh, over this period? Big thoughts to start with. Then we can go into maybe some details around aspects of this from energy and sanctions and so on. I think it's important to put it into the context and proportion because, of course, we know where are the limitations. We know that, for example, NATO wouldn't like to be engaged directly and will not be engaged directly in this conflict. We know that the burden sharing in sanction policy of the EU is an issue and it uh, creates limitations also in this 
sphere. But at the same time, we should remember, before we will start talking about loopholes, yeah, flows, and so, and so on, we should uh, uh, remember that uh, we, uh, we have an unprecedented uh, unity of the Union. Uh, it's not necessarily a positive remark, because it could be understood as a very negative remark <laughs> about the past. But uh, we didn't expect uh, such a level of, of unity in the Union. We shouldn't uh, uh, expect such a level of coordination between the EU and non-EU countries, including the United Kingdom, uh, United States, uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Australia. Without that, that coordination, uh, it happened just after the first weekend after 24th of February, so it was very smooth. Uh, the financial sanctions, especially the freezing of the national Russian reserves, uh, this is, uh, again, unprecedented to freeze the, the, the state reserve in a, such a scale. Uh, it, it wouldn't be successful. Yeah. And we, we managed, together with different uh, monetary areas. I think it is very, very important, together with U U UK, US, we managed to freeze uh, more than half of the Russian uh, reserves. Uh, we managed to adopt uh, six different packages of sanctions. Again, unprecedented. When you look at the sanctions adopted just after the Crimea war, after, after Crimea annexation, yeah. It is absolutely unproportional. It is, it is a new quality. So there are reasons uh, to, to be uh, optimistic about it because already, uh, what already happens is, is, is positive. I'm positively surprised by, by Europe uh, today. Of course, having in mind all the, all the limitations. I'm, I'm sure that we can build something more mm -hmm. on this base. Uh, I think we, we can uh, be uh, relatively optimistic about the preservation of this, uh, of this system, uh, both in terms of, uh, uh, of substance yeah. and the scale, uh, because of two different reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, Russians already did a horrible thing, right. and it's, it's important, and they, uh, and they will continue, I'm afraid. And it affected political class across the continent. Yeah. Even in, in usual suspects, uh, uh, we see the, the changes, and it affected profoundly the public opinion. Yeah. The political change in Germany, I hope it is just the beginning, we will see, uh, is, uh, is something. So uh, Russians will not create any good excuse to do anything else. Uh, another aspect is more historical one. I think we are much richer today uh, cause of the experience of 2014 and everything what happens next. Right. I mean, inefficiency of Normandy format, inefficiency of Minsk agreement. So the Russian, even the, if they would like to do it, it will be very, very complicated to create any sort of fake excuse or fake, fake reasons uh, to uh, change the European and what is most important, Western um, uh, approach, re Western reaction, coordinated harmonized reaction to atrocities of, of, of Russia uh, in, in Ukraine. So I think there are good ground, of course, having in mind the limitations we all yeah. know, there are, there are good ground, solid ground to be relatively optimistic about the revival of the Western community, which is good. I, I know that it's a little bit old fashioned, uh, both in Warsaw and London, but, but I believe that uh, the Western multilateralism is something positive and we should think maybe we should redefine it, of course, uh, but, uh, but we should think about this um, perspective in a more positive way because it can produce an added value for all of us, yeah. for security, welfare, and, and presence in, in the global affairs. Thank you. Let me, um, that's very clear, and I think you, you've provided the kind of political context in which uh, you believe we can have some optimism about the future in terms of, of uh, continuing unity. And you said partly created by Russia itself. Uh, uh, and it's both the way it's done what it's done and it's continuing action since then. So in a way, that's been a big external help. Olaf, let me turn to you as well. Um, and obviously, by all means, bring in the kind of UK and EU as well as European uh, uh, unity. From a UK standpoint, that unity uh, it, Ukraine's provided a doorway, in a way, for Europe to uh, come together with the UK at the heart of that process. 
Um, maybe you could say a word about whether, how confident you feel that sticking together, and maybe just as a bit of detail, has this helped the UK work with the EU? Um, specifically, if I think of sanctions coordination, energy coordination, has that provided some avenues which perhaps were a little closed off before in this difficult post-single market uh, uh, exit you know, uh, dis you know, phase, the, the arrival of the TCA? Um, yeah, is it, is it helped a little bit and how optimistic are you about the future? Um, thanks, Robin. And uh, firstly, to apologize for everyone that uh, you've got me rather than a minister today, there is some stuff <laughs> uh, happening in London that you might have you noticed. I know you have a more interesting um, uh, things to watch here, but uh, not far away there are some things going on. Um, uh, I was going to start in the same place as uh, uh, Minister Shemensky Shim on um, Crimea, because I think if you ask about what does unity, how does unity feel today, the comparison I think that we're making, but I think also that Putin was making was the lessons that he was learning from um, uh, Crimea. And his bet is that um, democracies are uh, weak and that over time they will uh, fold in the face of the economic and human reality of uh, prolonged um, conflict. And frankly, he's drawn that conclusion from our own uh, behavior. If I remember back in 2014, um, uh, working on that crisis, you know, it was only a matter of weeks after the implementation of some very weak, by comparison with where we are today, yeah. sanctions, that parts of our coalition were already talking about, you know, we should rem remove this or let's tell him what he has to do to get rid of this sanction. It was a completely different environment and I think he was expecting that. Um, so I think the fact that we haven't fallen into that trap and we are in a different trend is, um, is very positive. Um, uh, and I think um, uh, I'd agree with everything that the minister said. Um, on the other hand, I think we need to be honest with ourselves that that unity is fought for and will need to be continued to be fought for because um, uh, um, some bits of, of what led Putin to think that are true. So um, we are all going to be facing um, uh, a difficult economic context that's been exacerbated by um, this um, uh, conflict. Um, this generation in uh, Britain hasn't seen inflation at 10%. Mm. They haven't. So they're 10% poorer in a year. Mm -hmm. And how that uh, impacts people um, remains to be uh, seen. And that's going to be replicated right across the continent. So I think it's important that we, from in our governments and um, uh, uh, those of us who, who believe that we do need to face down this aggression, are honest with people about the fact that we're in this for the long haul, um, are honest about what that means and why um, we need to be taking that um, approach. But I think the basic answer to your question, Robin, about am I, am I optimistic is, is yes. I mean, two years ago, we yeah. were asking, is, is NATO brain dead? No one's asking that today. It feels more united. And I think the summit last week was a huge success. And the entrance of Finland and Sweden is really a very big deal for European um, uh, uh, security. And I think the same is true of the kind of the wider West, which is certainly a, a a concept that we feel very comfortable um, using. If you look at the way that the G7 has operated with the EU in it in this conflict, I think that has been an excellent um, example of what we can do together. And from us as the UK, yes, we have worked much more closely with the EU right. since February um, than uh, in the previous two or three years for obvious, uh, obvious reasons. Some of that, frankly, was starting already. So you talk about sanctions. As that work was starting already. Suddenly, it was needed, and I think it came together. So, with the EU, but also with the, you know the member states, we've had mm -hmm. the fact of leaving the EU plus COVID meant that you had a period where British politicians and diplomats weren't travelling and seeing their European counterparts in the way that they had been for the previous 30 years, and you've had in six months more more bilateral engagement than you had in the six previous years. Mm -hmm. I think the habit of that coming back is a really positive thing. Mm -hmm. And certainly with, you know, over, with Poland probably more than any other country, that's been, um, I think, very welcome and uh, has recreated the, the habit. Uh, and just quickly, uh, one quick follow-up, and I'll come back to you, Conrad. Um, people talked about the lack of a treaty on the foreign security policy front yeah. was going to leave uh, an overly ad hoc uh, kind of arrangement. Um, so, in a way, has that been a problem? Has it not been a problem? Was the very fact a crisis creates its own mechanisms? And is that the story you take away from this one? Um, firstly, I think this, the debate around kind of structures has tended to be a bit overblown because it's come from the emotion of 
of the way that the TCA was constructed and the, the debate um, around it. Our approach is basically what works is what matters. Um, it's not an ideological thing. It may be in the future that we do have some kind of more structured version of that relationship right. with the EU. The question is what works and has it worked here? Yes. Um, uh, there are very regular exchanges um, uh, with the EU at the, at the, the highest level. Um, we recently installed um, uh, for the first time a kind of secure hotline with the External Action Service um, uh, and the Foreign Office. Um, that wasn't even in there when we were a member state. So I think, you know, there isn't ideology about it. The question is what works. Mm. Wonderful. So look, just to follow up on, on one question and one point you made, um, Conrad, because obviously we're not just talking about the EU here, we're talking about Europe as a whole. Um, you said uh, NATO won't be involved. I think the way you said that, the implication was that's a good thing in the sense that if it were, there were a decision to try to involve NATO in the Ukraine conflict, then that would potentially lead to divisions within it itself. Is that what you meant? Because uh, no, I, I wondered exactly, what exactly. I wonder what you meant by that. So if you I, could maybe unpack that for a little bit. I don't want to go into of speculations, yeah. but, but I just wanted to, to describe the limitations we all have. We yeah. all have, yeah. including the U.S. Yeah. Because probably the U.S. is one of the, of, the, of the part of this structure of reaction, very, very instrumental. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to bring that uh, point uh, right at the beginning. So if we just move into um, a couple of the specific aspects about the future of Europe, uh, let me just bring a couple of the ones out that might be examples of positive outcomes of this and just, just take us through what you think about it. I mean, energy security in particular, part of your remit when you were in the European Parliament, um, it has been transformative. Uh, I was on a panel last week where somebody said that European energy has moved from east-west flows to west-east. And obviously at this particular moment with the UK playing quite an important role in helping um, boost up European gas reserves ahead of the winter, uh, there has been a fundamental shift. Could you just say a word or two about where do you think, is, is this going to change the whole way that European countries think about their energy security, working more closely together? What's Poland's experience been so far on this? And maybe I'll come to you if I can. Uh, as well? I think it's very clear for every single capital today that uh, uh, wrong national decisions on energy of some capitals um, created enormous limitation of strategic projection of Europe as a whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, gas dependency to, to, be, to be clear. Yeah. And uh, it means that energy matters and uh, the market uh, is uh, very helpful, especially now, also in crisis situation, but the national competences were used by some capitals in a way which, uh, which created that limitation of all of us. Yep. Of course, I'm very, it depends on perspective. I'm, I'm satisfied that we can move in the right direction today, but of course it's a little bit too late because if we wouldn't, if some capitals wouldn't make such a, such a bad strategic decision at that time, and we advised not to do it, mm -hmm. with Nord Stream 2 especially, and Nord Stream 1, we would be in an even better position mm. than we are today. Of course, we are, we, we are happy to see that all capitals agreed that anyway, we will pass out from Russian fossil fuels, including gas, before 2030. It's a political decision, political declaration, something in between, as you know, the conclusions of the European Council is yeah. something in between, um, but, but it's something, it's a progress, of course. Uh, but we couldn't agree on, uh, on strong sanctions where we have an instrument. So, of course, the limitations are, uh, are there. And the, the nearest winter will show us, probably with, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with an enormous impact to our national political life, how weak we are well, exactly. in energy. And, uh, of course, the crisis is to, to, to learn, to draw the right answers. And from our perspective, the answer is the security first, right. uh, a new partnership, because we can't substitute Russian fossil fuels with renewables only. Yeah. We would be happy to do it, but we can't do it. This is a physical thing. It's not a political uh, decision. Uh, so we need a new partnerships, as we have with, with US. Yeah. Uh, US. We agreed that 30% of of Russian gas will be substituted by, U, by U.S. I remember the time, especially in my, in my parliamentary years, that such a declaration would be a sort of blasphemy. Exactly. Because we know what sort of gas we are talking about. <laughs> uh, so, but the situation changed, for better, of course. Uh, and we could agree on sanctions on coal, uh, which is tough also for Poland. We could agree on sanctions on oil, 
with some exemptions, but in the end we, we have it. So energy is, is important for, for Europe and, uh, and we have to be much more ambitious in building uh, the diversification of flows uh, and market, uh, including the, the security mechanism. The security regulation was approved in 2009. I've been even reporter for this. Uh, but we have to develop this sort of, of, of solutions because otherwise we will be exposed for the big players in the energy market and we don't want it. And uh, Olaf, to what extent in the UK um, obviously is not as um, legally integrated into, doesn't have the same frameworks for integration into the European energy markets it had before, I think, as my understanding, but, um, you know, so, but at the moment, Yes, we are actually integrating a lot more in terms of supplies, interconnections, electricity, gas pipelines. Is this a sort of priority in the government side? Is this part of a new strategic interconnection in a way between continental Europe and, and the islands of, of Great Britain? Yeah. I realise the, the game here is that you ask the questions, but I'm going to ask one. What do you think the biggest news story was this morning? News story this morning? In Britain, what was the biggest news story? Our export. Our exports are in surplus, I think, because we're exporting gas. No, I've no idea. No, it was, it was the, uh, obviously everyone else knows this, but it was the, um, uh, uh, the biggest ever investment in wind. We announced the contracts for um, hundreds of millions of new wind turbines on, on land, uh, on sea, and also floating on sea. Um, uh, you must have missed it. There must have been something else going on in your life. But the, um, um, uh, I raised that because, obviously, as the answer to your question is yes, we need to be making massive investment that was in any case a strategic imperative i think what and yes the answer to your second question about interconnection is important if you think about the number of interconnector projects that are in play now you know we just opened the biggest um gas interconnector with um uh, norway earlier this year projects with uh, germany belgium um the netherlands um that clearly is something that we need to be doing there's also hydrogen projects with lots of those countries as yeah. well. So we need to do that, and we were doing it anyway. I think the reflection I would have on what this crisis shows, which I think is, is sort of the, the point you, you make, is, uh, you know, I was talking about the West. You know, we, we need to be savvier about the world we're operating in. Um, uh, and energy, because it is physical as well as economic, is probably the most obvious example. But the same thing is true actually across huge swathes of the the economy, telecommunications, right. actually goods in the longer term, uh, and, and services. So um, the conclusion that I think people are drawing isn't just from energy, isn't just about energy, though that is very urgent. It's about, it's an example of a macro problem. But do you think, I mean, this is a very big question, maybe not a fair one to ask you, but I'm going to ask it in any case. Um, do you think there is a, um, a sort of strategic shift going on almost maybe despite where certain parts of the government that's now sort of outgoing would have been to realize that uh, interconnection with Europe in many ways is part of Britain's future strategic positioning. I mean, global Britain was often painted as the world beyond Europe. Do you feel that there's been a really strategic shift as a result of Ukraine? Because um, you mentioned it, telecommunications, we've got energy, we've got security. I mean, it's more, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty big. Yeah. Um, well, I think if you, if you think about it, firstly, um, the, the TCA, so the trade agreement that we agreed as when we left the EU, provides for energy uh, transfers. It's, it's a different system from the single electricity yeah. market, and it's less, it's, uh, less efficient as it uh, would obviously be. But um, that, was still, that was still built yeah. into the, um, the system. So I, think, I don't think that is, is new. And if you think about the uh, integrated review, um, uh, which for our Polish friends is our kind of strategy document outlining the government's uh, external strategy through 2030, it says Russia is the, Russia is the short-term strategic threat and that our commitment to Europe is, is total. So I would say, yeah. actually, this is a manifestation of that exact strategic insight. Does that mean that the, the wider commitment to kind of engaging with the rest of the world is less somehow been proved to be wrong? I don't think so, because um, as um, uh, the minister was saying, the role of the US in this, Japan, I think, has been a really um, key player to keeping that wider coalition together, Canada, Australia. Yes. It is uh, not, it is about Russia, but it isn't just about Russia, it's about the West standing together. Um, one more question to you, Conrad, then I'm going to open up. So please have your thoughts, questions, comments ready, and we'll take, we'll take a group, and I've got a couple coming in here as well. Um, do you think European unity is going to extend as well to other areas at the moment? Um, will there be 
I don't know, uh, could we see something more in the financial dimension? I was wondering, Poland obviously is not inside the euro, um, but I'm wondering whether, whether something like the euro is an area where Poland would think, gosh, there would be greater strategic security looking forward now to, to think about that differently. I don't know where public opinion is uh, on that particular area. Take that as one example. There may be others as well. I think euro uh, a currency isn't defined in a strategic uh, perspective in Poland. I think Poles, uh, being very pro-European, appear to be very pragmatic on currency integration. And since the uh, since the crisis, uh, they are quite distant to to the monetary integration. We have relatively positive experience with our own currency. Uh, we will see what will happen next, of course, because we are all under enormous pressure of inflation mm -hmm. across the continent, including the non-Eurozone countries this time. So, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a matter for, for future deliberations. But, but for the moment, Euro isn't uh, understood as a, as a strategic asset. But I think the, the, the war uh, is, is very clear in terms of conclusions from our side that the cooperation of the whole Western uh, axis, or the, the Western world, uh, is the right answer for every single major global mm. uh, challenges we have. Or we can solve it, maybe we can solve it, but only together. And whatever framework we have, EU, NATO, or anything else, uh, it is important to pay attention to this aspect. So that's yeah. why I think this deliberations about the uh, uh, closed autonomy, yes. uh, emancipation, mm -hmm. are not very relevant to... Mm -hmm. to uh, they've never been relevant, to be honest, but <laughs> they are totally irrelevant to the problems we have uh, in common. Uh, I mean, the global problems uh, ahead of us, including Europeans. And I think there are plenty of areas where cooperation is the right uh, perspective. It's not only about uh, security architecture. This is the basic thing, of course. And we know that this sec security architecture is under enormous pressures. But it's also about trade. Uh, even before the war, we have a very clear experience of uh, definitely too high dependencies. And together with the <laughs> digital and climate transition, we have to be very careful to avoid situation where we uh, change one dependency on mm -hmm. Russian fossil fuels to another dependency, even more mm -hmm. profound dependency on raw materials. Mm -hmm. I think we should be very careful here. So uh, the, the, the global trade, the, the raw materials, the, the security. And last, the, this is for, for two-day seminar, but I want <laughs> to flag the problem, yeah. the, the internet governance. I yeah. think um, I have a lot of doubts if the system, the political system we all have, uh, with different, of course, uh, colors, but, yep. uh, but the political system based on uh, not only flow, but even more important, exchange yes. of a free, uh, um, rational, and skeptical opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the vehicle of progress in, in our world. The skepticism is a, is a backbone. I don't need to explain mm -hmm. it in London, I think. <laughs> uh, if, I, I have doubts if this, this, that sort of system can survive uh, with algorithms mm -hmm. uh, totally out of control, uh, which are totally concentrated in promotion yeah. of emotion, hysteria, and, uh, and virality in the end. Yeah. I, I have a lot of concerns uh, about this, and I think this is another uh, very long-term question, but we already made some first steps with DCA, with protection of privacy and data. We have yeah. to do something uh, together, because otherwise someone else will define our standards yeah. for our people. Yeah. I, th I think, I'm pretty sure, at the expense of our values and the model of society we love. Uh, and this is the fourth, fourth aspect. I, I don't want to make it more or less important, but we have at least four questions yeah. to be addressed together. Exactly. Well, obviously the UK government's been making some big pushes in parallel now to those ones as well on online harm. And we had Jacinda Ardern here last Friday talking about 
precisely the algorithmic question, if you want to call it that, can you leave those entirely? And a session yesterday, actually, in this room uh, about the fact of, uh, you know, uh, having your political systems reliant upon platforms that depend on the profit motive and, in essence, advertising platforms to run your politi politics on is, is a risky thing. Right, let's get some comments and questions in. And uh, I've got lots more on my list here, but I would definitely want to bring some here. I'm going to start back and come to the front. Yeah, please, there, here, here. Oh. Yep, it's right, don't worry. Oh. It goes okay. to you. It floats up. Uh, Lukas Kulesa, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, so far, the discussion has focused uh, on areas of uh, cohesion or areas of convergence, potential or existing. Uh, but I, I would like to ask you the questions about the state of EU-UK relations, because I have the suspicion that there are some areas which are not covered by the spotlight. Uh, so now are these relations in the state that you want them to be? If not, what are the challenges and what do we do about them? We will definitely come to that. Um, and we were discussing this in uh, the coffee upstairs, so um, I'm glad you brought that, that one up. But let's, let's get three or four comments as well. I'm coming to the front first. Thank you very and I'm much. going here. Uh, uh, microphone's uh, coming because others have to hear it online. Yep. Speak away. Oh, right. Thank, th thank you very much. It's a question for Olaf, and it really follows what's just been asked. Uh, you were mentioning that the Foreign Office now has a hotline uh, with the EAS, the External Action Service. Uh, hotlines are meant for emergencies. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with the hotline. I'm not objecting to that. But what has been terribly missing ever since we left the EU is a, uh, a regular dialogue at official level and at ministerial level, not just an emergency like the invasion of Ukraine. Now, I suspect a lot of the problem was on our side, uh, that ministers, for whatever reason, w were hesitant uh, about talking about structural relationships. And I'm not suggesting there should be common institutions, but you guys in the Foreign Office, and ministers particularly, should be so regularly exchanging with uh, foreign ministers of EU countries, either not just bilaterally, but collectively. Mm -hmm. Collect that's the crucial point, because, final comment, European security was never a reason why we, people wanted Brexit in the first place. There was never a problem about European security. It was other issues. So it's a tragedy that that has been put on one side. Right, we'll definitely bring that question. Um, yeah, Charles, then Peter, or whichever order. Yeah. Charles Grant, Centre for European Reform. I have a question for Minister Szymanski. Um, I know in the past, Minister, you've told me that you are sometimes sceptical about French thinking on the future of the EU. I was in Paris last week, and what I learnt there was that Macron is very seriously committed to establishing a European political community. The inaugural meeting will be held in Prague in October. The two rationales are, firstly, the accession countries need to sit somewhere while the very long process of accession goes on, they need to be brought closer to the European family. Secondly, for countries that don't want to join the EU and are outside it, like Britain and Turkey, it gives them a place where they can take part in conversations on big strategic questions which, and help to socialise the British and keep them, as, as Malcolm Rifkin says, keep them talking to their partners. Are you favourable to this European political community? If, if so, why? And if not, why not? Okay, and I see you're taking notes. I'm taking notes as well. I've got these down. Last one, Peter, and then I'll, I'll bring everyone else in. Yep. So, Peter Watkins, an associate fellow at Chatham House and former official in the Ministry of Defence. Um, I'd just like to widen the uh, aperture a bit. Um, we've obviously talked today a lot about Ukraine and the Nordic Baltic area, but of course, Russia is being mischievous elsewhere in Europe, and I'm thinking in particular of the Western Balkans. And so, is there anything you could say about what the EU, Poland, and the UK should be doing? Uh, to address that, mindful of the fact that for a long time the EU provided a very positive perspective for the countries in that area. There's now a sense, I think, of EU fatigue. Certain countries have been in the waiting room for decades. Um, can you say something on that, please? Right. Let's start with that lot, and then I'll bring others in. And maybe what I should have done last time I said that, yes, and maybe I know somebody did have a two-finger intervention. But if you get me with the two fingers at some point, I'll, I'll try to you know, bring you in quickly on the back of the previous question. So if it's related to it, we don't have to restart. Um, but let me start with you, Olaf, actually, because we were going to get to UK-EU relations very specifically in a, in a more granular way. But you got the question there. Uh, what's not working? <laughs> so um, uh, divorces are quite emotional things, um, uh, uh, in my experience. Um, and so um, I think that, that, that is... Uh, <laughs> The younger generation overshare, so uh, there you go. Um, um, 
and so there has been a lot of motion to this over the last six years on both sides, and I think that underpins some of some of what's lying behind those 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 questions. But I think if you um, if you kind of uh, zoom out and look uh, look back at where we've come from, actually, I think more is settled than um, uh, maybe um, those of us uh, who are lucky enough to get to work on it every day necessarily see. So. Um, from the British side, although this is a very much a, a British debate, the sort of model of Brexit, I think, is now basically done in the sense that neither party, um, a main party, is campaigning for anything to do with getting either rejoining or coming into the single market or the customs union or the EA. Um, that's essentially based on, um, uh, firstly, a desire to keep the page turned and to look to other things, but also because the model that we have looks more stable than those options, um, uh, because otherwise you would end up with elections with different people coming in and wanting to change the, uh, change the model. Mm. So I think there's stability to that model. There's also uh, a certain amount of stability to the sort of, um, to the public debate now. You know, if you look at the, the main um, uh, determinants in recent, recent by-elections in, in uh, the UK, or indeed at the wider polling, Brexit is not the, the thing that people are voting on. So that being settled on both the UK side and frankly, I think on the, the EU side, you know, we're moving on now. The EU basically moved on in roughly February 2017, right? So um, there isn't, I think, a desire to reopen those things. And you have under, underpinning it a certain aspect of stability, first point. Secondly, I think Ukraine has been quite positive in helping to turn the page on the emotion of the divorce because the habit of um, uh, cooperation um, has come back and come back fast. Um, 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 uh, as, as you said, um, it needs to be both bilateral and multilateral. I think it was important that the EU invited the Foreign Secretary to the Foreign Affairs Council in, in February and that she went. And, and contrary to, um, to Twitter rumours, she even tweeted about having, uh, having, uh, having gone. And I think it's been a reminder, frankly, for, for everyone as we move through that, the emotion of it, that we're basically on the same side and that friends should want success for each other in the security sphere, but also in every other sphere. Um, so that's the sort of, those aspects seem basically settled. But I think your question was sort of suggesting that there might be some things that are less settled. Um, and um, I'm not a very good diplomat, so I'll answer the question. Um, uh, and that is to say, yes, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a, uh, is a big problem. And, um, uh, for, for both sides, and I think I'll, I'll come to, to that in a second. Um, for those of you who have uh, not followed uh, this debate um, uh, closely, firstly, congratulations. But secondly, um, the protocol is designed to maintain the balance between the Unionists and the Republicans in Northern Ireland uh, as we leave the EU so that the uh, north-south border um, between Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic is kept open. Um, uh, and also to, um, uh, but also to protect um, the, the Good Friday Agreement that lies behind that, which includes the connection between the UK, uh, Great Britain, I should say, sorry, and Northern Ireland, i.e. east-west trade, which is important for the unionists. Um, it's not doing that because the unionists feel that it is um, disconnecting them from Great Britain. Um, and there's been progress on that because both sides now basically accept that there is a problem and large swathes of what the solution might be, which is to do with uh, what we would call a green lane so that goods can get into Northern Ireland without being subject to e-checks. I think people broadly agree with that. But, um, uh, dis th but basically the EU's wider proposals don't go far enough. And from our perspective, not from theirs, they would say that we would say that they are refusing to, to move further in a way that would build a stable foundation for this. Uh, they would say uh, it's really very annoying that you want to change a treaty that you signed recently. So fair enough, they would say that, uh, and, and that's a fair thing to say. Our point is, this is a fundamental national interest to us, and we would like our allies and friends to understand why, and we don't think that the actual solutions that we're proposing are that hard, and we hope that we can get there. Because that isn't happening, we've introduced a bill um, to Parliament, which um, uh, we're conscious is um, a source of frustration to our EU friends, but I hope that explains why we've got there. Actually, I think if you look at this relationship, we have come through that, the emotion that I spoke about at the start. This issue, the protocol, is very emotional for us because it is the heart, it speaks to the territorial integrity of our country. I think if that is fixed, basically we've got all the other cards are on the table for 
uh, a much more productive relationship. Sorry, that was long. No, no, that was, no it required addressing. And I think let's just stay with this question first, and we can go to the other ones. Uh, Conrad, I do want to bring you in because, um, of course, what's happened is that the, the, the lack of trust that probably underlines the difficulty about finding a solution to the Northern Ireland Protocol has spilt over to financial regulation, spilt over science and technology cooperation, and a, a number of other areas. Would you share that sense that we're through the most emotional part and we're now down to, to one very big sticky issue in the UK-EU relationship? Um, what do you think from a Polish perspective? Where does Poland stand on this? I think it's pretty uh, visible that the Irish Protocol, uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol, uh, is, has enormous potential, I mean damage potential. So it has potential to damage the relationship? Yes, the, the enormous potential to damage the relation and enormous potential to intoxicate the relations. Mm. And of course, it is, uh, it is definitely bad news, uh, not only for countries uh, like Poland. Uh, we believe that we should strengthen our relations uh, and based on TCA and yep. build something even better. Uh, the, the question of uh, Northern Ireland Protocol could be very explosive because, because this is uh, uh, negotiated, agreed and ratified uh, international agreement. And of course, we can do whatever we want with every agreement as a union, but uh, to do it, we need a new mandate. And the new mandate to renegotiate the, the, the agreement, the protocol, uh, could be uh, available only uh, by an anonymous uh, decision of the member states, I believe. And, uh, and here we have a problem because uh, we are not at the beginning of this, of this story. During the negotiations, uh, prolonged negotiations, uh, we, I believe, we, we tested uh, tens, if not hundreds, of models of possible Mm. balance between the integrity of Great Britain and integrity of the single market on the other hand. And of course this specific situation, very, very specific situation, absolutely unprecedented situation, uh, um, is, 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 a, is a challenge for, to, to do both things in the same time. Mm -hmm. and of mm -hmm. course, both um, expectations are legitimate, but, but we are um, quite advanced in this so it is definitely beyond my imagination uh, how to reconcile these two mm. aspects. I, I try to understand the, the concerns presented by, by London, but in the same time, it's really hard to imagine the alternative to, mm -hmm. to, to the protocol. We believe that the pragmatic proposals, the, the, the flexibility package, let's say, as presented in, I think, in, in October um, by the European Commission could uh, lead to, to yeah. more uh, um, pragmatic solutions, but it, it, it didn't happen. So, so I don't know. I, I believe that the proposal to change the international agreement by unilateral legislation isn't constructive. I'm afraid that this is the, the, the proposal which would uh, be uh, damaging. Of course, we advocate on our side, I mean, the EU side, to be proportional in reaction. Right. This is the basic thing. I think we should be careful because this is the last thing we need today, this sort of, of disputes. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but the problem is well described. We are, we are not nowhere. We, we yeah. know where are the, the limits and it's really hard to, to imagine. It is the unilateral steps. Uh, are not invitation for negotiations, mm -hmm. as I sometimes hear in, in London. I think th this is rather provocative. Yeah. So um, it would be better to find alternative solutions to, to this and to keep it a little bit more calm because yeah. uh, the, 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 the potential of damage is, is, is enormous here. Well, what I'm hearing is the UK is not going to get rescued by Poland on this one, is what I'm hearing from your comments. I mean, we, not that no, you can, but I mean... We are talking not about politics, we are talking about legal and, I know, uh, that's, that's um, why I'm saying it. <laughs> environment. So uh, there are some things uh, which will be uh, uh, absolutely necessary. Yeah. In case of international obligation uh, uh, breaches, uh, the European Commission will have no alternative but to react, I hope proportionally, and that we will 
recommend other capitals to be yeah. proportional because we don't need it. Yeah. But, uh, but this is not about politics, about opinions. It's yeah. about, uh, about legal um, environment. Right. I'm sure we might come back to this. We've still got three more questions to go through, and I've got a couple online I need, and I've got at least four hands out there, but we're doing well. I wanted also to, to answer to, yeah. to other questions. Yes. Maybe, so maybe next time, because uh, Charles, for example, asked about... Yeah, the no, I'm do, we're doing them now. Community. No, I want you, I want okay, you to do... Okay. Um, and I thought we might move them around, just so you don't both have to answer both unless you need to. Maybe you could do the hotlines, what about regular dialogue, and maybe then, Conrad, you could do the one about um, EPC and the European political community and all of that. So why don't you start with that one first? Um, I probably used the, Malcolm Rifkins. Yeah, I probably used the wrong the wrong word by saying um, hotline, but it is a, a secure line. The point being that you can talk <laughs> at higher levels of classification. Um, you can use it as much as you like, uh, uh, and it is being it is being used. So that regular dialogue is happening. I was in Brussels twice in the last um, week and a half. Um, uh, I do actually think COVID has had quite a big kind of parallel impact on some of that engagement. But you, you're right to, to say underlying that has also been a kind of uh, a challenging political dynamic on both sides. I hope that this ex the experience of the last six months, I think for everyone, has been a reminder of why that dialogue is yeah. so important and the regularity of it. And you know, um, uh, I think for uh, for British ministers as well, you know, we've been because of during the the, the until 2019 so inwardly focused on the Brexit issue that basically leaving Parliament has not been an easy thing to do. And uh, let's see where we get to in making that easier in the future. Good. Um, Conrad, what, what do you think of the European political community? The, the community uh, Idea. has been presented by the President Macron uh, as a platform also for UK. I think that was the only country yeah. mentioned almost by name, if I remember well, in the Parliament. Um, but I, I'm, I have some, some doubts if it's, uh, if it's a format which would be comfortable enough also for you, because I understand that Brexit is Brexit and <laughs> any sort of institutionalization of the, of the cooperation with the EU isn't very welcome because it could be misleading for, for, for the for UK parts. But of course, I believe that we need better institutional cooperation called coordination because the war in Ukraine isn't the last uh, moment that we will need it any, anyway. So I'm very in favor of looking for new the concepts, of course, the the concepts presented by by French president, uh, we we received it with some suspicions, <laughs> uh, obvious reasons, uh, and we we sent a very clear message. That we are open to discuss it. We are not against it. But first of all, let's be clear: it 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 is not a substitution for enlargement policy. It shouldn't lead to any sort of uh, weakening the enlargement and neighbourhood policy. Uh, if we really want to create a format for all uh, non-EU European countries, let's do it. But I'm still not sure if it's the, the, the right uh, approach here. I'm afraid in case of Great Britain, where the cooperation, especially in, in, in this uh, war, uh, is, is so crucial, you know, we, we have to concentrate on in our bilateral talks quite intensive. Um, it creates unbalanced situation for UK um, diplomacy, probably, but uh, streamlining it in any sort of Brussels-based uh, format, I think, wouldn't be. Uh, I think it's too early. If it was based in London, it would work very well. <laughs> yes, the first Just thing kidding. probably it would be to, to choose the right city, and <laughs> Brussels right. is too popular, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to come in on that? Actually, yeah, I think we probably should. As the UK yeah. was mentioned, is it? <laughs> so I think. Um, uh, for us, there are two questions. The first is this question about enlargement. So we don't, we don't get to have a say uh, in enlargement, and we won't. But we do care about um, uh, the Euro-Atlantic integration of um, uh, the non-member states in the, uh, in the East. And so we will take a large chunk of our lead from, from them, is the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, um, which plays to the minister's um, uh, point, um, you know, we don't know exactly what this what the community uh, will be, and obviously there's, there's discussions to be had and details to come out. I think that the, uh, when we were upstairs just, um, just now, uh, as a slip of the tongue, you referred to, um, uh, 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 you said the, the EU. Oh, sorry, I mean Europe, yeah, yeah. right? And the challenge, if you're uh, a country like us outside, is that they aren't the same thing. And some of the ways that the EPC has been described sound like sort of EU holding rooms. 
Mm. Now that self-evidently won't work for us. And as you said, I don't think we'll work to come to um, uh, Peter's point about the Balkans for countries who feel like they've been, they've been strung along and we'll see this as a sort of, you're coming down a hill and you're being diverted into a dead end, right? Um, uh, so that I think is a key question that we would have is, yes, Europe needs to look at its architecture, self-evidently after this crisis, that, that, need, that, that is not just and cannot just be about the EU. And if I might make a kind of broader remark, you know, the way that the EU, which is the framework power in, in Europe, has, has expanded since the 1990s, um, uh, including under British uh, um, uh, le leadership, um, it, it and we did that through basically exporting regulation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that approach has now sort of run its course mm -hmm. because it's no longer attractive in the way it was and it creates difficulties for Switzerland, for us, for Turkey, um, for the Western um, Balkans. So I think there is a, a more interesting strategic question about how does Europe as a continent organize itself when that dominant, dominant kind of energy has, has run its course? Um, yeah, I suppose the question is whether it's run its course for all countries or whether a country like UK that's pretty regulated feels it's run its course, but if you're in Albania, you might not think it's run its course, but I mean, that's the question. But let's bring that in then, because the Western Balkans was the remaining question. Um, and why don't you just pull off that then? Where, where's the British government in the Western Balkans? How concerned? Where are we? What can we do? What are we hoping that you would do? And Conrad, I'll let you say a word about the Western Balkans, and we'll do the next round of questions. Um, I think it probably depends which country you're, yeah, you're looking at, right? So, but uh, Al Albania, I think um, uh, we, f we feel relatively positive about, but I think the Albanians are obviously um, uh, have some questions about um, uh, the, the way that the enlargement process is, uh, is operating. That isn't for us to have, I don't think it would be fair for us to have yep. uh, a view on um, anymore. I think the real wor worry, and you spoke about um, uh, Russia, uh, is obviously Bosnia. Uh, where we talked about one process having run its course, but the kind of data and energy um, is also in, in clear um, trouble. And Russia has not only uh, proxies and um, uh, on the ground kind of activity that makes that difficult, but they also have a vote in the UN, which if you're looking at the EU4 mandate um, is, uh, is a real worry. Um, so uh, we absolutely need to kind of wake up again that, you know, uh, it turns out that things happen in, in Ukraine that you thought you left behind in the 1990s, and mm. that could be true in Bosnia too, and we need to wake up. That's why we've sanctioned um, the Republic of Serbska um, uh, leadership, and I think uh, we, all, we all, as Europeans, need to step up to that. I think it's good, for example, that um, um, Chancellor Schultz did a tour of the Western Balkans ahead of the last right. European Council in the way that Merkel used to, um, but we all need to re-engage. Any comments on Western Balkans, Conrad, um, or a country in particular one, if you want to mention? Of course, we, we are definitely, we, we, are, we advocate enlargement policy revival because we believe that this is one of the strongest instruments of influence of Europe around our borders. And we believe that it's a positive influence because we export stability, uh, reforms, uh, market integration, and so on, which is good for us and good for, for the candidates, countries. But at the same time, we see the political development uh, among the Western Balkan countries, and it doesn't look good because the bilateral questions sometimes can uh, delay the process for months, if, if not years. We spent two years talking about the new methodology of enlargement. Intellectually, very, very attractive thing, but we finished the process, and the enlargement is still in the same place. So. So here we, we see the limitations of the European Union at glance. So uh, in the meantime, because we will never forget that the, 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 the baseline scenario is, is enlargement. But in the meantime, I think we can do a lot of pragmatic things like the market integration, like the visa facilitation, uh, many other sectoral integration. And I hope where it will be it's substantial enough not to lose this part of the world, because at the moment, I think it is under-evaluated by many capitals, definitely not by, by Warsaw. We see a strategic competition for this part of, of, of Europe, and we are losing. We are not gaining ground, we are losing ground, and it is, of course, at the expense of our uh, economic interests, 
and at the expense of our security interests. And th this is what we try to explain the countries, sometimes neighboring countries, which are uh, playing with this, uh, with this process, sometimes purely internal battles. Mm. I think it is, uh, it is unproportional, but this is the, also the reality of the European Union. This is also the beauty of anonymity. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we should remember about it. Yeah. Um, I've got two questions online, which I'm going to take, because I think they're very important. I'm coming back to the room. Um, we've got 10 minutes, and then we've got the drinks upstairs. So hang in there, folks. A couple of, I think, very important questions. One, uh, Conrad, for you, um, because it really is focused on the EU. Um, Piotr Rodwald asked the question, um, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, uh, is the dispute over rule of law, which countries uh, are adhering to EU standards, Copenhagen principles on rule of law, uh, how is that going to play out between EU members and EU institutions? Is it likely to be a new form of division? Or, sorry, is it going to continue to be a form of division? May it grow or might it not grow? I believe that the, uh, the, the, the controversy we have, uh, a little bit too long, I, I would add, over the rule of law is in the principal uh, conflict because uh, we share the same set of values together with the rest of the Union. The values of the treaties are the values of our constitution. So I refuse to define this, uh, this controversy, which is painful to be honest. I'm, if, I'm afraid there is, there is no winner in, this, in mm -hmm. this game, but I refuse to define this, this controversy as a controversy over the values because the values are the same, but the implementation of the values according to our own constitutional identity and together with the principle of conferred competences, uh, as it is described in the, in mm -hmm. the treaty, uh, creates, uh, as in this case, uh, an almost, uh, again, uh, potential of damage. Uh, we try to control it. Mm. We try to separate it from uh, all other aspects of our smooth European cooperation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think, uh, anyway, it would be better to, to close this controversy. But it's been partly closed through Ukraine. I mean, it seems a little bit, if you look at the, uh, you know, the partly, fact that you've been able to get some of the EU money. It's closed for the last six years. So. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm waiting for something more. <laughs> yeah. Or from the EU or on the Polish side? No, this is responsibility, of course, of both sides. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to make such um, shallow yeah. games who is yeah. responsible. We all need to pay more attention to, to close it. But most important, this is not a fundamental controversy. This is a controversy about implementation of values. Yeah. Not about values. But would you say it's the same for Hungary, or is it think it's more more fundamental in the EU's relationship with Hungary? Because then it has become quite toxic. True. I think we 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 managed to control the the traction. Uh, we are not fully successful in this, but uh, but I, I think we we can control it. But most important is to to concentrate on on finalization of the, of this controversy because again we don't need this sort of controversy. Sometimes it leads to, uh, to fundamental misunderstandings yeah. because sometimes it dominates the, the whole perception of our role in Europe, which is absolutely unfair. Yeah. Um, so both Stephen Anderson and Paul Hummers ask a similar question about the NATO strategic concept and what it really has inside it and whether it contains a seed of a problem. Stephen Anderson actually quotes a part of it. He says, the strategic concept says that NATO seeks, quote, stability and predictability in the Euro-Atlantic area and between NATO and the Russian Federation, and, quotes, meaningful and reciprocal political dialogue is essential to our security, i.e. with the Russian Federation. So is, kind of, is this realistic? He then paraphrases, and Paul Hummer says, is there actually there a gap between the NATO strategic concept and the US national defense strategy uh, when it comes to how we think about Russia? So you know, was this NATO strategic concept disguising in its reported strength actually a sort of underlying desire to try to already be pre-cooking in some forms of dialogue that may be going to be very difficult to achieve? I think the, the concept is much wider document and you can easily find uh, different quotations which yeah. would balance the, 
the whole picture of the of the of the strategic concept. The moment of the adoption of the concept is is very important here because this is the the most fundamental context for this document, and we should read this document in this context. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a, it's an again it's a progress toward yeah. right direction, strengthening of the eastern flank, more realistic political vision where we are as NATO uh, with our big neighbor. So, so definitely the concept is, uh, is, is, is in progress. But, but in the end, of course, we have our own, I mean, you, uh, big uh, conceptual documents. And uh, when uh, war started, everyone understood very, very well that the reality check is everything. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the way we will react as a EU, as Europe, as a Western world to this world, to this war, it will define our role for mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the way we react, this is the core yeah. answer, and not necessarily the, the documents, because okay. documents could be... I mean, so far, I think one could say the EU's reacted pretty well um, in terms of response, so far. Back to the first question. Right, last round of questions. You've been waiting very patiently. I thought I saw a hand over here, but maybe I didn't. Maybe we're down to the last one. Okay. Two. <laughs> right, the last two. One, two. Question. So, uh, or comment, uh, or whatever. Yeah, uh, Peter Arak, head of the Polish Economic Institute. So I wanted to comment on the euro and Poland. Uh, you, you, you know, you have an enlargement within the European Union because the eurozone might become bigger uh, with Croatia and Bulgaria joining in uh, in a few years' time. But um, the issue for bigger economies as Poland, Czech Republic or Romania is uh, as in the catching up phase of development to have its own uh, currency. So uh, in Poland, the majority of people uh, are not in favor of having uh, the euro. Uh, also, uh, most of the businesses are not favorable of uh, having the eurozone, uh, have being in the eurozone or having the euro. We're an exporting economy. Actually, the currency sometimes is useful because, it's, uh, de wow. because it depreciates. And the uh, final comment is that uh, the euro is not a nuclear deterrent. It doesn't help <laughs> in that way. Which you might want to join if it were. Um, thank you very much. And yeah, please, the microphone's above you now. Yeah, it's just a thought process that sort of, um, sort of pinged between people earlier. Um, and I'll listen with, intently to the, the Foreign Office section. Um, I think our Chinese colleagues, the quantum sort of uh, entanglement mentality, um, it, wouldn't it be a process, and I know that time for negotiation is probably not, uh, not the best at the moment or, or available, but to build this golden bridge for our friend Putin to retreat over, that, uh, to get a process that you can actually win, where he can actually finally say, look, for whatever reason, health reason, would be my family, whatever, so he, he can actually retreat over, rather than try to humiliate him and destroy him is the only way of winning. So maybe a thought process to say, look, things are not developed the way you want for the good of the economy of this country, for, for Europe, for the world. Maybe perhaps we should need to rethink and give him that option rather than to find ways to crush him, some of barrack bonds or whatever. So there's a big question. Um, and it, it gets raised often, um, this question. So I'm just wondering, starting with you, Olaf, whether there, is there a golden bridge out there that, that the British government's thinking about, that some sort of retreat mechanism that, uh, that he could head down? And I suppose it's a sub-question, because it was on my list. You know, if we don't just freeze but seize Russian state assets, and I don't know whether the British government is on that, and the EU is discussing it, you know, that could be a, become a big dividing point, not just with Russia, but obviously a dividing point potentially within the EU or between the UK and the EU, depending on where we went. Mm -hmm. um, so any thoughts just on, on yeah. that big question, but then maybe with the freeze versus seize as a little sub-question of mine? Yeah. I mean, we, we started the, the first uh, point of the discussion was about looking back at Crimea, but yeah. we could do the same thing with, with Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, I think... We've spent a lot of time over the last 15 years giving Putin off-ramps. But it turns out the off-ramps keep leading to another bit of Eastern European uh, uh, territory, right? So, um, uh, uh, and, you know, exactly the, the policy description that you just made was what led us to kind of Crimea, Minsk, Normandy, Minsk to... Uh, and 24th of February uh, this year. So that isn't to say 
that there isn't some truth in uh, in what you say. Um, uh, but I think there is a real risk of fundamentally misreading the psychology um, of this man and the uh, set of objectives. And that, in the world we're in, where Ukraine needs our help, both material help, but also psychological help, is a risk we are not willing to take. And that's why it was essential for me to hear you but say no one this. Said, yeah, but no one said, exactly. no one has said he needs yeah. to be uh, uh, destroyed. He needs to get out of Ukraine. It's just that, sorry, it's just that I, for me it was important for you to state this. Oh, yeah. so, so absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm a fine extraction, so uh, I know where it comes from. So, exactly. Yes, but it needs a statement to acknowledge this is what's been done, but also never say never at the same time, but he's had so many chances. Okay. Yeah. Thoughts on, on this point and maybe freeze versus seize? Um, of course, we're also, we're also is in favour of. Um, uh, of not only freezing but also seizing the, the, the capitals. We are not talking about any private uh, capital or private right. ownership. It's a kleptocracy mm -hmm. network uh, based on corruption and criminal actions. So that, that counts for their official reserves as well? Uh, yes, uh, um, because um, formally, of course, we are talking about private property. And of course, in the West, we are very hesitant mm -hmm. to, to make things like this. But, but this is only formal point of view. I think there is nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with the substance or with the reality of this problem. You might say there's quite a few governments around the world with large reserves where you might be interested to know how they got there, if you see what I'm saying. So there would be a precedent of quite interesting sorts to be setting here. No, the, the adoption of the sanctions, uh, which uh, frozen the, um, the, the reserve of the state, of the sovereign state. state. Exactly is unprecedented. We already did it. Uh, I don't know if the uh, time will come when we will be able to, uh, to seize it. Right. But in case of private uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, property, it's, it's pretty clear. I think this is an important asset to reconstruct uh, Ukraine. And I think it would express the, the spirit of international fairness. Mm -hmm. Because we are not talking about private property. Mm -hmm. It's the only formal aspect of this property. Yep. It's a kleptocracy network of, uh, um, of, of different sort of, uh, of managements of uh, legal entities and so on, but there's nothing to do with private property. Um, I think uh, the, the question of Golden Bridge, uh, mm -hmm. I, I fully understand the sentiment, the expectation to find a way like this, the civilized way. Uh, to de-escalate the problem. But I think the, this concept, as many other Western concepts, how to de-escalate the situation with Russia is based on uh, one uh, basic mistake, the, the assumption that at least partially we share the same rationality, that we have something in common in terms of what is worth doing and what is not worth doing in, in this situation. And I, I think this mistake was pretty much presented by the German policy in, in energy. Uh, in goodwill, Angela Merkel believed that building the dependency is a dependency on both yes. sides, that, they are, that we are dependent on Gaza, they are dependent on, on Euro, and it's pretty fine because we, we can control each other. It would be true in case of any other country which would share the German rationality. Mercantilistic in this way, very, very much. Mm. But it doesn't apply to the country, which is based on quite a different, fundamentally different rationality, if you need to say, uh, mm -hmm. to call it rationality. <laughs> and I think this is the problem. This is a historically well described philosophical problem. Uh, Putin uh, isn't very interested in Golden Bridge. I think he has quite different expectations, quite different satisfactions in, in his life. So I'm afraid this Western-style solution, which will be re really, really welcome to, to finalize this thing, will not uh, fly. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm conscious we've had a very, very long day, uh, and we've put our two speakers here through a lot of questions, both from me, but also from the floor and from online. Thank you very much to those who've joined us. Uh, online for this as well. I'm not going to try to do a synopsis. We're only halfway through the program um, and we'll have plenty of opportunities to wrap those things up uh, tomorrow. But I will say, Konrad Szymanski, uh, Olaf, thank you both very much indeed for um, taking the time to uh, answer these questions, to share your thoughts. I mean, it is a moment where we've had appeals for pragmatism um, and I'm just wondering whether my own little editorializing at the end, um, the UK 
EU's relationship, certainly with the EU, will definitely enter a different phrase with a different UK Prime Minister. Um, quite what it'll mean in a material sense, I'm not clear. But I think in an emotional sense, and you talked about divorces being emotional, um, uh, I think uh, it'll create a different context, both for the UK-EU relationship, but then in the end, obviously, for the UK-Poland relationship. Because I think we heard, very importantly from you there, there's a lot of desire to work closely, and we do work very closely bilaterally. But then when it gets into those areas where the EU competence is both strong uh, and strongly defined legally, uh, and also in Poland's own interests, then we can end up actually having areas of division in the future as well. So uh, let's hope those will be minimized. Um, thank you very much.